NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. So my, my talk today is on vehicle forensics, and I'm going to take you through the history a little bit of vehicle forensics, and when we talk about vehicle, vehicle forensics, I think the first thing people think about are black boxes, but um, I had the opportunity to um, approach an infotainment system specialist on a murder case that uh, myself and, and my partners Tom Breen and Todd Pugh in Chicago uh, had a few years ago, um, and it's, it's really interesting technology. And in terms of the, the lawyers in this room, how many of you have had Celebrite on your cases? It's pr pretty much everybody. It's about looks like about 85% of the room. Um, how many of you, in comparison, have had Burla on your criminal cases? So maybe three? Maybe three people. Um, Burla is... It's the Celebrite for vehicles and the infotainment systems in the vehicles. So infotainment system, different than the black box, if you're in the, um, if you're in the actual vehicle, the black box is underneath the steering wheel and the infotainment system is, is the computer screen that you see in the vehicle. They used to only be associated with luxury vehicles, but now more and more um, every vehicle that is rolling off the production lot uh, has an infotainment system in it. And those are computers very much like the cell phones that we carry in our pockets and have been uh, a unique focus of Fourth Amendment law and of privacy law in the country. So uh, that's what my talk has to do with today. And I'll take you through a little bit of the history of what we can call, I guess, connected cars or smart cars in the timeline of that. Uh, the major components of, um, of vehicle forensics, I think, uh, are a few different categories. So black boxes, GPS, and then the infotainment systems. Black boxes, which are also called event data recorders, were invented in Australia in the 1950s. The purpose was to record flight data um, as well as voices and sounds in the cockpit prior to the crash. Later, they're adopted into trains and motor vehicles. And um, now we have them in, in vehicles. You see them in accident reconstruction work and um, in major vehicle on vehicle accidents. So they don't, they don't typically activate if it's a pedestrian versus uh, motor vehicle accident, but they activate when there's major accidents. And they record uh, both the sounds before and after the crash event. Um, and those are the devices that law enforcement uh, pull after a major crash. So um, they're relatively limited in terms of the information that they provide, and the ones that are in uh, airplanes are much more sophisticated and more detailed in the information that they provide. Um, the forensics tool that is used referred to, um, it's the, the Bosch Crash Data Retrieval Tool, you see on there, it's the, it's the green thing right there that is connected to the computer and then connected underneath the steering wheel. But that Bosch crash data retrieval tool, um, it plugs into the port under the steering wheel that your mechanic uses to repair a car. It's widely used and it is available and police departments throughout the nation have them. It's because it's not particularly costly and um, it's not particularly hard to use. So those devices are prevalent throughout law enforcement agencies uh, in the country. GPS, um, we know GPS, it's on our phones, it's on our computers that are in our cars. So it's created in the Sputnik era. Scientists track satellites with shifts in radio signal called the Doppler effect. Um, and the US Navy conducted satellite navigation experiments in the 1960s to track submarines with nuclear weapons. So GPSs, we all rely on them. I use Waze every day when I'm uh, coordinating uh, different cities and, 
the fastest route to get me to a place. Um, so we rely on GPS a lot, and GPS has been an important component of some of the Fourth Amendment uh, law that the Supreme Court has dealt with in Jones, uh, and I think will be very important when uh, our courts and the Supreme Court approach the privacy and constitutional protections that people have uh, to the data that's in the infotainment system. Um, here is the kind of the chronology of smartphones in terms of what they look like and what they're able to do. So um, nowadays, you know, Apple launches a new iPhone, I think every September, traditionally, and now they're, they very much are like our computers, right? So um, most of the day we're on them. And in terms of functionality, if you get into somebody's cell phone, you're able to see their entire lives, which is, of course, true with our clients. And in the last two trials that I've had, inclu including the Corey Morgan trial that I'll talk about, the data that was pulled off our client's cell phone became some of the most damning evidence in the case. So the ability of law enforcement to get into uh, your client's smartphone can be the difference between your client getting charged and not charged, released from the station uh, without charges, or it can be the difference between an acquittal and a conviction in a criminal case. They contain a great deal of information about uh, about your client. This is what is uh, said to be the first smartphone, the IBM Simon Personal Communicator. Uh, it's said to be the first smartphone because it's got a touch screen and it was able to, you're able to communicate over email and fax on that SPC device. Um, this is kind of the smartphone that we know now is the, the Apple iPhone. And if you look at your iPhone, um, there's going to be a ton of different data on there. So if you go into my iPhone, I probably have 90, 100 apps. If you go on there, you could access a lot of information about myself, my family, where I've been, and also a lot about my clients, right? So because our, our phones are very much our, our mobile computers. So you can get into my Dropbox, you can get into my email, my text messages, my photos, my videos. And in, through this uh, window, you can map a person's life and know a lot about them. Political affiliation, medical data, biometrics, some of the more sensitive areas of uh, data. So that brings us to kind of a, what I think is a distinction in the law about when courts approach uh, the search the searches of new devices in the digital era. And I think a theme that has emerged from Jones and Riley and Carpenter is that digital information is fundamentally, it's categorically different than when we talk about physical items. Digital privacy, passcodes, and biometrics. Um, anybody that has a smartphone uh, is familiar with the different ways that we're able to safeguard our information. So um, in terms of lawyers in this room, how, how many of you have a passcode on your cell phone that is six digits or more? Okay, how many of you have a passcode that is 12 digits or more and it's alphanumeric? Okay, um, so I, I don't suggest this, but I, I have a passcode on my phone that is 17 digits, it's alphanumeric, and I, I have that because in learning about this stuff, I found out through talks with Mike Price, at, who's at the Fourth Amendment Center for NACDL, and from talking to Lars Daniel at Invista, that that is what allows me to keep my data very close to safe. So when I first talked to Mike Price, I had a... Uh, compelled decryption case in Chicago um, and we were ordered our client to give up his passcode. Search warrant had been issued, a reckless homicide investigation, pre-charging, search warrant issues. We politely declined to give up our passcode based on uh, the advice of his attorney. They go to court and they get a compulsion order. Okay, now you're compelled to give up your passcode. Um, in talking to Mike Price and fashioning a motion 
to ask the judge to uh, reverse that order. The, um, I said to Mike, well, I've got, a, I've got a six digit passcode. How long will it take law enforcement to get into my phone? And he says, well, I think with a six digit passcode, and this was three years ago. So with a six digit passcode, it would take law enforcement 17 hours to get into your phone, less than a day. With a four digit passcode, those are kind of what is commonly thought of as the defaults in terms of the settings. So a lot of people don't know that you can go in, you can make your passcode longer. Four digit passcode, less than an hour. So, you know, there's a search warrant, they hook up the device to celebrate, and they can crack a phone with a four digit passcode within an hour. Six digit, uh, less than a day. So what I did was I went into my settings, which I didn't know I could do, and I, I did a 12-digit passcode, which was not terribly hard to do or frustrating like the one that I have now because I already had a six-digit passcode and I just did it twice. It's easy, right? So I felt pretty good about that. I felt like, you know, I'm ahead of the curve. I'm really protecting my data. And then I, uh, at, at the last NACDL meeting in Austin, I talked to Lars Daniel from Invista and I said, do you have, uh, you have Celebrate? Yeah, we have Celebrate. You, you got Burla? Yeah, we have Burla. They said, okay, well, I have a 12-digit passcode. How long will it take you to crack my phone? And Lars said, well, anywhere, f he said, is it alphanumeric? And I said, no, it's not. And he said, well, anywhere from two hours to 30 years. And I was thinking, I thought that it was gonna take over 100 years for them to get into my phone. You know, me, like most of our clients, not that I have anything to you know, worry about on my cell phone, other than like the most intimate details of my life and my clients' lives. Um, so I changed it to a 17-digit alphanumeric passcode, and that's where we are. But I, I, you know, it's frustrating, but I feel pretty good about it, that I'm protecting my data from companies, law enforcement, and, or thieves. I mean, you know, these things do get stolen, and I, would, I don't want you know, it to get broken into and all that data to be revealed to the world. Um, so that is, the, that is the, the advice that I give to my clients is that, oh, let me, let me ask one more thing. How many of you have biometrics in terms of a, a pass, you know, password protection? Thumbprint, face, facial recognition, as it, to get into your phone. Okay, so probably about 30%, 40% of the room. As we approach privacy and Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment protections, there's different cases that have, um, have grappled with these issues about the contents of your mind and what that means to produce that in a Fifth Amendment uh, context. And what has emerged is that biometrics have very little protection. So basically presenting my face or a thumbprint to uh, to my phone or to law enforcement is it's similar to being presented uh, in a police lineup, right? There's, I, I, there's nothing that's constitutionally protected about that. Courts have differed on that, but what they've said, I think uniformly, is that if you have a passcode, that is, reveals the contents of your mind. You have to go into the recesses of your mind to uh, know what your passcode is. And especially if it's like 17 digits and you're always messing it up. So uh, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, I always tell all my clients, take the thumbprint off, take the facial recognition off. There's a number of reasons to take facial recognition off. But um, both is that it does not protect your client's data. And if compelled to do so, um, it w your client has uh, lesser protections under the law if he has a biometric, he or she has a biometric, uh, either a thumbprint or a face to access and unlock the phone. So that's what I tell all my clients, get rid of the biometrics, get a long passcode, 12, 13 digits, alphanumeric, and in that way, you, you know, listen, a judge can compel your client to give up the passcode and they, they'll have the opportunity to do that and comply or take the contempt. But, I think any, any time when presented with that situation, I would like at first to make sure that I'm on the, the soundest constitutional ground that I have, and then maybe take your contempt, and especially if there's something in the phone that may make the case against your client. So that's, that is the, uh, the advice that I give to all my clients and that I would, um, that I would 
share with you as well, because I think that it doesn't make a lot of sense, right, like that that's a difference between a passcode and a thumbprint, but for some reason, the courts have made that distinction, and you know, we, we should be in front of that issue, because the more and more law enforcement is moving towards dumping our clients' phones, getting that data, and making that case based on the data that it provides. So that brings us to the infotainment systems. They're also called onboard systems. You see the, the ex, how it looks externally there in the passenger compartment. So it's the screen in the middle of the vehicle. Just because uh, it'll tie in later. Did anybody rent a car when they came to Vegas for this trip? No, okay. Uh, well, it'll tie in later, but basically, if you rent a car and you plug your phone in, it's not advisable because of all the data that it sucks down. So the infotainment system, you can connect your phone with Bluetooth or USB. And here is the CEO of Berla, Ben Lemaire, who trains law enforcement um, throughout the nation. They have a partnership with law enforcement and they, um, they, they have a forensic toolkit that dumps all the data from the modules on the, uh, the computer, the infotainment system of vehicles. I think a lot of people right now who are listening to this are probably thinking, well, yeah, but I have to do something special for my car to download all that information, or I have to hook it up in a certain way. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, if you, you know, we use this scenario all the time in our training. You know, if you're, you're on a flight, you fly in, you rent a car, and uh, you know, your phone died, you're gonna get in the car and you're gonna plug it in. And there's going to be this nice, convenient USB port right there for you. Now, when you plug it into the USB port, it's going to charge your phone, absolutely. And as soon as it powers up, it's going to start sucking all your data down into the car. Um, there's one manufacturer in particular that will ask you, do you want to download your contact list? And of course, you know, being a rental car, you would say no. Uh, and it honors that one thing, but it takes everything else that can get its on. <laughs> It's, it's funny, I mean, they actually you know, said, well, you know, people care about their contact lists, and little do they know that their entire text messaging database is being sucked out onto the car. Um, so it's uh, shocking, right? I mean, your whole phone is downloaded into a rental car, um, text messages, medical data, your communications with people sucked down into a rental car for the world to... Um, to have access to in companies and potentially law enforcement. And what's different about these systems, fundamentally different, is that, yeah, they contain a massive amounts of highly personal data about ourselves. But, you know, and, and Tesla may have a new model that does this. I know of no uh, manufacturer that has a password protection on on these devices, right? So on any of our own vehicles, I have a vehicle, I bought it used, and I can see on there a little about the previous owner's life. So I, there's locations where they lived, um, you know, their favorites in terms of contacts, and I have an older car, so like I don't have the, the most, you know, updated Tesla, but what everybody says who works in this field is it pulls down more and more information as the modules in the infotainment systems get more sophisticated and Berla's technology gets more sophisticated. Um, so in, in the fact that there is no mechanism to safeguard your privacy is um, deeply troubling. So that's, that's Berla. Um, Berla, it's founded in 2008 by Ben Lemaire, the CEO that you just heard speak, uh, works closely with state and federal law enforcement. It's had a partnership with the federal government for the last six or seven years, specifically with the Department of Homeland Security. And Berla went from the analysis of uh, handheld GPS devices like Garmin's and TomTom's to the, the more sophisticated infotainment systems that um, are now a part of our daily lives. They launched this IV vehicle forensics tool in 2013, which is um, the same tool they use now. They update it uh, multiple times a year, and with each update, they can gather more information, and they can dump the data on more 
types of vehicles. So they can, you know, I think I saw that they now can dump the data from about uh, 20,000 different types of vehicles. The um, Burla will acquire and then analyze the data from that infotainment system, the reports, and I'll show you a part of one to you. Um, there's an examination report from the Morgan murder case and your materials. Um, the, the acquisition reports are longer reports. They're similar to like Celebrate reports that you would have seen. They contain hundreds and hundreds of pages of data and a lot of different categories of data. So what is your, vehicle, what is your client's vehicle reveal? I think I've you know, already touched on these a bit, but communications, text messages, emails, um, contact lists, call logs, navigation history, and medical data, and then um, applications and passwords. So that brings us to uh, the murder trial of Corey Morgan. Uh, Corey was charged with two co-defendants co by the name of Dwight Doty and Kevin Edwards. When it made it, the case made its way to trial, Kevin Edwards had pled. Uh, Corey went to trial with Dwight Doty, and it was uh, it would have been a death penalty case if Illinois still had the death penalty because. Um, the victim of the crime was a nine-year-old who had been lured into an alley, shot execution style, and it was based on a purported motive that was attributed to Corey Morgan that this was revenge for the killing of his brother and the shooting of his mother and uh, in the context of a gang feud. Here's a clip that kind of sets the scene uh, of that crime and the eventual investigation and trial. In Chicago today, there was a tragic revelation in the murder of a nine-year-old boy. Dean Reynolds is on that story. All week, Chicago has been asking why nine-year-old Tyshawn Lee was murdered in this alley. And now, the police have supplied a horrifying answer. We believe that Tyshawn was targeted, lured to this spot, and murdered. Gary McCarthy is Chicago's police superintendent. Probably the most abhorrent, cowardly, unfathomable crime that I've witnessed in 35 years of policing. Tyshawn was on his way to his grandmother's on Monday afternoon when he joined others in the alley near her house. That's when the boy was swept up into a bloody feud here involving two rival factions of the same gang. His execution was the latest in a series of vengeful assaults going back months. Police say Tyshawn's father, Pierre Stokes, is an active member of one of those gang factions, and they believe that's the reason his son was targeted. Stokes himself agrees his son was intentionally killed. If he wasn't a target, he wouldn't have got hit so many times in the back of the face. You know what I'm saying? I think he was targeted. So that sets the scene. Murder of a nine-year-old in Chicago. Um, international media attention and pressure on the Chicago Police Department, the investigation. Uh, there was a federal task force uh, with the Chicago Police Department and different agencies to find out what had happened to Tyshawn Lee. So the investigation starts. Prosecution's uh, narrative or theory of the case was, was a gang shooting, happened in broad daylight. It was uh, based on a gang rival between the Black Peace Stone Terror Dome Stones uh, a set of them called the Bang Bang Gang, BBG, um, and the Kill Award faction of the, of the Gangster Disciples, um, Tyshawn Lee's father being a member of some prominence of the Kill Award section, and Corey Morgan, his brothers, and his co-defendants being purported members of the BBGs. Um, the victim, of course, a young, innocent, sympathetic child, lured away from the park with the promise of candy and juice, shot execution style, based on who his father was. City was not safe from the ruthless killers, witnesses were in danger, and of course there was intense uh, public and media coverage of the murder and the investigation. The, um, what emerged as the vehicle that was involved in the homicide, because um, the, the homicide happened uh, on November 2nd, 2015, shortly after uh, school had let out. It was about 
you know, it was right after school, three, four o'clock in the afternoon, and there were eyewitnesses at Dawes Park, which is at 80th and Damon on the south side of Chicago in the Auburn Gresham neighborhood. Uh, there was kids from the high school and the middle school that was close there to Dawes Park playing basketball in the park who became the eyewitnesses and the eyewitnesses identified a black SUV that was circling the block, went down the alley right before the murder. So uh, the Chicago Police Department uh, focus in on a black SUV as being the suspect vehicle involved in this heinous murder. And they recover a black SUV, a 2015 Ford Edge, um, that was abandoned and trashed and had uh, white substance throughout the interior of, of it that they thought was bleach. Um, and they recover that vehicle in Dalton, which is a northwest suburb of Chicago. And the Illinois State Police recovered um, the infotainment system module and they sent it out to Birla to be um, analyzed. So you see there um, on the, the bottom left, right there is the infotainment system that is common in these vehicles and the murder happened in uh, at the end of 2015. This was a 2015 model vehicle. So uh, it was a rental car that was reported stolen and there was certain information over the months uh, between production and uh, being on the streets and then being ultimately recovered. This here is the module, the infotainment module from the inside and here's another uh, photo of the module from the infotainment system. So they send this module to Maryland to be analyzed by Berla. And Berla um, has this forensics tool called IV um, that they launched in 2013. And unlike the Bosch um, system when it comes to black boxes, the Berla devices, they're not that prevalent in uh, local law enforcement. There's some state police agencies that have them, but they are very expensive. And the other thing is that there's just not that many people that are trained on um, on how to use them. So as we approach these cases, I think proficiency of your local, you know, because I, I think they will proliferate. We will see these in every major police department throughout uh, the nation, much like we do with Celebrite uh, in the years coming. So proficiency of examiners and also the Fourth Amendment protections that our clients have to the data on their vehicles. Of course, in this case, it was a vehicle that was associated with a co-defendant it was abandoned, so um, there was no Fourth Amendment challenge to the data that was recovered, and the data that was recovered was pretty precise, and it was pretty convincing that it was corroborated by other information, had the vehicle by Dawes Park, had the vehicle going to Lansing uh, later in the day, whereas uh, my client lived with his girlfriend and some of her family members, and so when we approach cross-examination, we use that data uh, in, approaching and cross-examining the state's expert, who was Ken Case, from Birla. Um, in this case, the, the, the software is expensive, but also the time is expensive. So in this case, because of the nature of the case, pre-trial, um, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office and the Chicago Police Department, they split the cost, but uh, Birla had a bill of uh, approaching $30,000 pre-trial for all the parsing of the data, analysis of the data, and then ultimately Ken Case comes into town to testify in the murder trial, and this was a trial that there was not gonna be any expense or manpower uh, spared. So they flew in a DNA specialist in uh, probabilistic genotyping from Australia, um, and they th flew in a guy from Berla from Maryland because this was a case that uh, they wanted very hard to prove and get convictions and long, long sentences, uh, understandably. Um, this is an acquisition report from Birla. So this is like the dumping of the data, the extraction acquisition report. As you can see down here, um, it's about 700 page report. So not quite a celebrate report, but a lot of data. And then you have here kind of the general categories of data 
that exist on the infotainment system. So attached devices like cell phones and any other devices connected by Bluetooth or USB, text messages, call logs, contacts, locations, events, which become important, and tracks. And that's not like tracks like, you know, urgent. That's, uh, that's tracks like tr tracking data, GPS, and, and then files. So these are the attached devices, um, and you see a lot of different names here. So there's a bunch of iPhones, Ashley Brown, Charbon, Chauncey, Jesh, Kingston, Steve, Zare, and then you have unique identifiers, Bluetooth addresses, serial numbers that are associated with all those different devices that connected to the infotainment system of the Black Ford Edge. And you know, it was important to us that it didn't say Corey Morgan's iPhone. I mean, I think my iPhone would show up as like Jonathan's iPhone 2 or something like that, which is, would be pretty good evidence, especially if Corey Morgan's iPhone is identified as Corey Morgan's iPhone, he's in that vehicle, and it connects to the vehicle, you know, during the time period that the murder happened. We did not have that in this case, but we did have some 16 devices that attached to uh, the infotainment system during the, uh, the data period, which was about a, about a year of data. The CLE verification code for this program is A9A062. A9A062. Here you've got events, um, and these are different events that are associated with the vehicle, like shifting into um, reverse, neutral, park. You've got phone events, so those are different phones that are connecting to, um, to the infotainment system in the vehicle, and they show the date and time, and they show the GPS coordinates. So it becomes pretty important in terms of uh, showing when exactly the person that's associated with the phone was in the vehicle. Then you've got uh, gear shift events here, which I, I already covered, um, but also has the date and time and GPS coordinates. You've got door events, so door open, door closed, passenger door open and closed. This, this was important for Corey Morgan's case because the theory was all three individuals were in the vehicle at the time of the murder, in, in preparing for cross-examination, um, I interviewed Ken Case and asked him some questions about, frankly, I didn't know anything about Burla, um, like many of us don't, because I had never seen it on a case before, and so I had a lot of questions about the different reports that he issued, the acquisition reports, the examination reports, and what the capabilities of the Burla system was. So in this case, what we found out was the rear doors on this particular module, based on you know, the, the IV tool that they had at the time, because it varies based on those things, that the rear doors were not monitored in any way, right? So you have, uh, you have front door and front passenger, but not rear door, not trunk, anything like that. Um, and you also didn't have things that would be relevant to knowing how many people are in the vehicle, like like weight, right? I mean, you, you have three people arrested, you have their heights and weights, and so you would be able to, if you were able to get a weight assessment, you would know how many people uh, were in the vehicle. So we didn't have that in the case, and um, that was important to our preparation in terms of approaching this data and approaching the state's expert from Burla. These are what the uh, tracks look like, and there's logical and recovered tracks. The recovered are ones that were recovered from the data that had been written over, but they were still able to be recovered. And if you see here, um, in terms of time, these, these are GPS coordinates, right? And they coincide with vehicle speed, and they coincide with a specific date and time. And the different times here, it's almost every second, right? And I think that becomes important, um, both in terms of how precise it is, but also in terms of when we uh, anal 
analyze this from a Fourth Amendment perspective vis-a-vis -vis Jones and Carpenter in terms of the long-term tracking of an individual's movements through GPS and other data. Um, but a ton of data. So it's about 700 pages, the report. About 50% of that is just the GPS data. Um, and like I said, very detailed, very precise, and uh, long-term tracking of the vehicle. This is the examination report. Um, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office had asked Ken Case and Berla to look at some specific addresses that were relevant to the case. The three that are highlighted here are an address on the south side. It's 106th and Green Street. It's Kevin Edwards, co-defendant's uh, house where he lived with his siblings at the time of October and November of 2015. You've got the Lansing house, which is uh, our client Corey Morgan's girlfriend's house, where he lives with his girlfriend Robin and some of her family members. And then you have the location of the Taishan Lee homicide on November 2nd, 2015, um, you know, right after school. So these become important because of what the witnesses were saying. And disregard the, the, high, the, the red highlights that were made uh, in preparation for closing argument. This was the only transcript I had. But this is um, the, the motive here. This is from the state's opening statement. And they say, they talk about motive and they talk about what the data on the vehicle can show. This is the prosecutor. They call themselves the BBGs. Pierre Stokes, Tyshawn Lee's father, he was a member of the Kill Awards. And back on October 13th of 2015, this feud escalated. And it escalated when Morgan's brother, Tracy Morgan, and Morgan's mother were shot. Morgan's mother survived, but Tracy Morgan was killed. Now Tracy Morgan was a fellow BBG, and killing him was bad enough, but shooting Morgan's mother was beyond the pale. There weren't many rules in this feud, but family was off limits. They were untouchable, and so this made Corey Morgan mad. And he wasn't just mad, he was in a murderous rage saying he was going to kill grandmas, mamas, kids and all, whomever he could catch. That becomes a very important statement of motive. And um, it'll come later, but that statement was attributed to Corey Morgan at Kevin Edwards' house on a certain date uh, by Kevin Edwards' sister. Continuing on, uh, later in the opening statement, uh, the prosecutor says, and this defendant, Corey Morgan, he was identified by four different witnesses as being there. In that black SUV, it was later found abandoned in Dalton, Illinois, and it turns out that black SUV is a Ford Edge the same Ford Edge that Kevin Edwards had been driving for about a month before Tyshawn's murder. And that Ford Edge has GPS and navigation capabilities. Now GPS and navigation, they can get you where you need to go and they can tell you which direction to go, but they can also tell where you've been. And I'll give you one guess where that Ford Edge was on November 2nd, 2015. It was circling Tyshawn's house and it was parked near the mouth of that alley where Tyshawn Lee is ultimately killed. So the co-defendant's co uh, siblings, Kevin Edwards' siblings, his sister says, Corey Morgan, the day after his brother, Tracy Morgan, tea time was killed, came over to the Edwards' house at 106 and Green, and when she was there, he says to Kevin Edwards, according to Kevin Edwards' sister, that the GDs, he used a different word, uh, the GDs done tweaked, when they killed Tea Time. Everybody must die. Grandmas, mamas, kids and all. And I say, when I say, that's what he said, that according to her, this was the third party admission that was put on blast at, at the bond hearing and was provided the motive that was attributed to Corey Morgan. This was personal. It had to do with his family, but it also had to do with his gang conflict. And Kevin Edwards' sister said, I knew specifically the date that this happened at my house because it was the day after Corey's brother was murdered. They came to the house, they were pissed, he asked to use my cell phone, and he made this statement about killing children. Kevin Edwards' brother had said that from October 1 through November 2, he saw Kevin, 
Corey and DeWright, the three co-defendants, together on a daily basis at Kevin Edwards' family's house at 106th and Green. During that time, Kevin is driving the Black Ford Edge. That is exactly what Robin Matthews, Corey Morgan's girlfriend's nephew said. I'd see him every day. You know, he was like, he was always at Lance and he was unemployed. He, he said, I, I basically never left the house. And they would come there, all three of them, every day, Black Ford Edge, every day for a month. So what does the data show? Because Ken Case was asked very specifically, look at these addresses. What does the data show for 106th and Green? Shows that there's some data from October 20th, November 1st, October 29th, and October 31st. And for Lansing, it's only October 29th and November 2nd. So that becomes important. Absolutely no objective data from the Burla device that corroborates what the state said uh, had occurred in terms of this statement that's attributed to Corey Morgan. Same thing as to you know, how often these witnesses said they saw uh, all three together and at these different locations. So this is, and I'll take you through because I think I'm running short on time. This is the state's PowerPoint presentation from, that they showed to the um, jury. It was important in, in the preparation. They tried to show me some slides in court of this thing. And I was like, can I get the PowerPoint presentation? And it had all of Ken Case's notes in there and everything. And so it, the, the cross it evolved, but it, you know, there was a ton of information to, to mine um, from this device. So here's the PowerPoint presentation. The vehicle is at uh, Old Farm Road in Lansing, Robin Matthews's house where Corey Morgan lives at about two o'clock, a little before. And then it maps uh, where it goes. It goes to a gas station up the street. There's video from there with Kevin Edwards on it, right? So it's showing the data is corroborating what we know to be true. No data. So there's no data for this period. And it's not because it was destroyed or anything like that. It had just been probably written over. So when it picks back up, we are by Dawes Park. And the black Ford Edge is going around. And there was also an address in there that was an address that was attributed to Corey Morgan's family, which I thought was particularly interesting because you know, if, if he had gotten into the vehicle, if the jury thought he had gotten into the vehicle, it's, it's possible that he was dropped off over there. He certainly wasn't going to some place that he, you know, never went, and they went there to do this execution. So this is the vehicle's movements. The X is where the murder happened in the, in the alley there. And it's got recovered tracks. It's showing the different movements, the different uh, events, shifts into reverse, shifts into parks, vehicle remains, passenger door closed, driver door open, USB device it's attached, and this is said to corroborate what the witnesses, the eyewitnesses were saying occurred. Then there's no data, it picks back up around a little before four o'clock, and the vehicle's going around the neighborhood, and ultimately arrives back at Dawes Park, up there in the, in the top left, and then, Parks at Dawes Park, around the time that Tyshawn Lee was there playing basketball on the, the playground. Different vehicle events, driver door open, closed, passenger, passenger door opened, closed, no data. And then the vehicle picks up going back to Lansing, where Corey Morgan lives with his girlfriend and his girlfriend's uh, family members, including the nephew that testified against him bunch of different um, vehicle events at the Lansing house, consistent with people getting out of the vehicle. Going back to the gas station, video of Kevin Edwards on the, on the gas station video, different vehicle events, and then no data, and then the vehicle data picks back up vehicles in Dalton, last known position of the vehicles recorded in Dalton. So that's a trial. Um, in, in preparation for the cross of Ken Case, it was important to emphasize the amount of data that was available to him and law enforcement. So, you know, I had all the acquisition reports there to show the jury just how much data we were talking about. So, you, you know, he had done three different parsings of the data. He actually told me on the phone call that he did another one that the state didn't even know about with a new tool to just make sure that it was consistent and if there was anything else. But his findings were consistent and that was important to show that the data is precise. 
because we, we accept what we can't really refute, but we use the data to show the witnesses, um, you know, they were not telling the truth about what they said, Corey Morgan had said, and what they said about that black Ford Edge being there every day. So they were gilding the lily. So what happened to Corey Morgan? Three week trial, um, my partner Todd Pugh gave a brilliant closing argument. Um, the jury deliberated for about six, seven hours until nine o'clock at night. The judge locked up the jury, took away their cell phones, sent them on a bus uh, by escort of the sheriff's deputies. We found out this, some of this later, and they were put up at a hotel on the southwest side of Chicago. Not quite the Four Seasons. Um, and they come back the next day, they deliberate through lunch, and ultimately, Corey Morgan, as you all know in this room, as, as defenders, becomes a victim of the trial penalty. So, um, judge ultimately sentences him to uh, 65 years in Illinois. Murder time is done at 100% um, for any murders nowadays it, after 1998, uh, 1998. The offer pretrial was 25 years. It was nothing, despite anybody talking to uh, Corey, nothing that he was ever going to plead guilty or accept. Um, so that was rejected on the record, understood the consequences and the exposure of going to trial, that if he was convicted, it would be and was a de facto life sentence. What the future holds um, for these infotainment systems, I'm running kind of short on time, so I'll be quick with this, but Fourth Amendment, and I'd invite all of you guys to come to Chicago next month. The Fourth Amendment Center is doing a two-day free CLE um, on May 16th and the 17th at the Sofitel. It's going to be excellent, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Fourth Amendment in the context of the infotainment systems, but basically, um, there's a professor from William & Mary that has written this uh, it's a working paper, it's not published yet, but he takes the position that his theory is that courts will likely uphold warrantless searches of smart ca cars based on the automobile exception. He does not think that Riley, Jones, Carpenter will be extended to these smart cars. And there's a few different reasons why he says that. Smart cars hold less information. Uh, a lot of the vehicle information is already avail visible and available to the public. Cars are heavily regulated and le receive less privacy protection. And police cannot use Faraday bags or tin foil or airplane mode for vehicles in the automobile exception. It's not automatic like a search incident to arrest. It's based on probable cause. And that based on this, um, how slow the Supreme Court moves, that Congress and state legislatures should amend privacy statutes to require police to obtain warrants. In my experience in Chicago, they generally obtain warrants for this type of information. My theory, Gershowitz is wrong. Uh, searches of smart cars require a warrant and digital is fundamentally different. I think we talk about the long-term tracking of this stuff, of, of the vehicle. It's right on line with Jones and Riley about how sensitive this information is. And there's a case from Georgia uh, from their Supreme Court about Fourth Amendment protections of the black boxes, a lot less information, and that, that those are uh, subject to protection of the Fourth Amendment, and that the automobile and exigent circumstances exceptions to the warrant requirement do not apply to those types of searches of a black box. So there's a bipartisan bill that's been proposed um, in the Senate um, in November of last year, and it would close the loophole about warrantless searches of infotainment systems. Um, and here's a quote from Jumana, uh, from the director of the Fourth Amendment Center. Um, I think I'm a little short on time, but probably have about three minutes for any questions. So the question is, what is the purpose of collecting all of the information on the vehicle from, from your phone? It's, a, it's a, I think it's for convenience, right? I mean, when we're in our vehicles, we want the convenience of being able to have seamless connection to the vehicle so that we can make phone calls, we can access our Spotify, and we can access our files. We shouldn't be looking at you know, our files while we're driving to court, but you know, it's, it's for convenience. The question is, does the, does the data download even when you just connect based on Bluetooth, not USB? 
The answer, and it's complicated, but is yes. And it was, you know, I, I included the, uh, the testimony of Ken Case in the Morgan murder trial in your materials. So we talked a little bit about that because he had written some article that he said that he didn't write. And, but that, that was kind of on, on point. Do you need to connect? Does it have to be by USB or Bluetooth? And basically it's, yeah, it, it dumps data uh, no matter what. Hi, yeah, can um, you talk about the timestamp that they get for the data? How, where is that coming from? Is it from the car, from the phone? Is it, is, was there any testimony from Burla on how that's reliable? No, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with any. It's in terms of the time frame. I, I think that it's the capacity of the module, just like our computers, how much memory and data it can contain. And then at a certain point, like a computer or other uh, digital devices, it writes over old data with newer data. But I don't think there's any outside capacity issue, you know, if there's, if there's a large... Uh, no, not the, not the size, the time. How do they know the time is accurate? How, how do they know the time exactly? No, how it's accurate, like the timestamp, like we heard about yesterday with the cell phone towers. Those, those timings are probably more accurate because they're connected to a network. Where does the car, like if it says it was at 1024 and 16 seconds, where is that timestamp coming from? Did, well, was I was it? one of the guys that raised their hand, like not terribly comfortable with cell, cell phone towers yesterday, but I think it's based on, you know, on GPS and, you know, those different radio systems and antennas from phones or from the, the module itself. But it's a good question. I, I don't exactly know. Presentation at lunch and walk you through what it looks like now and we can talk about timestamp data and the GPS location data as well. Great. Thank you very much. And, you know, and, and some, of the, some of our vendors have Burla. So Invista, Garrett, and some of the others, they have Burla. So talk to them. And then come to Chicago next month for the Fourth Amendment Center's Unlocking the Black Box, free two-day CLE, uh, May 16th and the 17th. Love to see you there.